Whether there's a war on or not, old Mother Earth goes through her paces every season. But whether the Earth has turned to choking dust or clinging mud, war goes on through its paces. And the guy fighting that war has to keep right on too, mud or no mud. Only part of war is fighting an enemy who threatens your kind of life. The rest is fighting things like the land and dirt and hunger and fear and the rest of the dirty business. In the South Pacific, it's been jungle. In Italy, it's been mud, sucking down the tires until the vehicles and the guns capsize. And the roads and ditches are jammed with mire tanks and jeeps and seven-ton trucks. Enemy artillery and stukas are tough enough in Anzio and Casino. But the Nazis can also thank that black oozing goo for slowing up our liberation of Italy. There, mud speaks with a German accent. Because at this front, it's been raining for weeks. And an army's got to fight that rain somehow, and then fight the mud after the rain, and keep the ordnance and food going up to where it's got to go. And that's it. They've got to get up there. That's all. You don't have schedules in war. You have engineers, the guys that have to fight everything but the enemy, and usually him too. They gave the engineers the battle of mud to fight in Italy, and they said, get rid of it. Like that. They said, get the stuff through. So they get the stuff through because the bulldozers are there shoving ahead like snowplows. And behind them, the engineers are blasting mountains into gravel and making roads from what once were probably donkey trails or mud bogs. Even now, they're not four-lane concrete, the kind of roads peace has time for. But every mile laid down by the engineers brings us one mile nearer to victory and home. while I blow about the U.S. Navy. Take our newest battle wagons. The great Iowa class. Everything's tremendous. Even the anchors. Each hook weighs as much as a tank. How safe are they from air attack? Compared to any battleship of three years ago, these new babies throw up an umbrella more than 100 times the size. The Iowa whips up enough juice to furnish a city of 20,000 with all its power and light. And speaking of lighting up cities, these ships are built to do a little lighting job on the cities of Japan. One ship tosses shells at the rate of 1,200 tons per hour a payload equal to the bomb load of 300 flying forts. So, do you mind if I blow? Hell no, let's all blow. The most useful piece of equipment the American soldier carries isn't G.I. He brought it into the Army with him, and he carries it here, right under his bucket. This is the gadget that runs the show, steers all the jeeps, fires every shot. While the soldier's brain is winning the war, in its spare time, it's preparing for peace. Thousands of men are getting set now for good post-war jobs. Courses in more than 600 college, high school, and technical subjects are being sent out daily by the U.S. Armed Forces Institute to American soldiers all over the world. Courses in everything. Carpentry, bookkeeping, chemistry, plumbing, art mathematics, and engineering. Thanks to the Armed Forces Institute, the brain that the American soldier took into the Army will be of greater value to himself on the day he takes it home. G.I. Shoes. Two pair to every man. 
multiply by the number of men in the services, and you've got a lot of leather. Put into one piece, it would cover 2,893 acres. This hunk of hide cost the nation 75 million bucks. Yet, every month, acres of this leather are burned up by soldiers who try to dry wet shoes by giving them the hot foot. <laughs> Listen, pal, you can't eat them. Why cook them? anniversary of the founding of the Army Service Forces, it seems to me, is a proper moment for self-appraisal. It's the moment to inventory our successes and our failures, to look backward and look forward, to re-examine our methods and to ask ourselves pertinent questions. How have we done? How do we stand? What does the future hold? 